inflation keeps prices down far more effectively. <laughs> Comrade Karanja, His Excellency says you are unbalanced. I am a man in search of man. I was never in search of God. My guest today is a Lamont professor of economics and philosophy at Harvard University. But he's no narrow economist, nor is he merely a philosopher. He's a distinguished social and political theorist. His economics is grounded in empiricism and rationality, and his philosophy assures us that people are not merely statistics, but human beings. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Amartya Sen. Uh, professor Sen, what sets you apart, perhaps, for me uh, as an economist, is your promoting of ideas such as justice and fairness. Uh, you have, as it were, put a moral agenda to, to, to your work as an economic philosopher. Is that a fair description of your striving as an economic philosopher or a philosopher of economics? Moderately fair, I think, but <laughs> not, I'm not sure fully, because a lot of uh, philosophers, of course, are interested in issues of, um, um, of justice and morality. A whole branch of philosophy is concerned with that, and a lot of economists have been concerned with it not only classical economists like uh, Smith and Mill and, uh, and, and others, but also um, a number of modern economists. So I'm not sure it's a very distinguishing feature, but it certainly is not an inaccurate description of what I try to do. You have said, uh, the, and I'm going to quote, uh, the assessment of the claims of equality has to come to terms with the existence of pervasive human diversity. Can this console me that I am somehow deserving of my privilege? You can't assume that every human being is exactly like every other. Quite a lot of theory proceeds as if that were the case, and I think ends up being a very unjust theory. Um, just to take an example, if a person is more prone to illness than another person is because of some condition which he, which he or she may have inherited, to give them this, that person the same income as another person and leave them free to buy medicine and medical treatment would be very unfair because he or she will be deprived even with the same income. So that equality in terms of income would be unequal in terms of actual freedom to have a good life. Uh, and it's that kind of consideration which any theory of equality has to face. And I think you were quoting that from my last book, Inequality Reexamined. And much of the book is concerned with the different perspectives in which you could examine inequality. And how do you place this in the context of uh, affirmative action uh, in the United States or, or our own sort of reservations for castes? Well, the, um, it's the, uh, most of the uh, differences that we observe in the context of caste, etc., are not, of course, genetic differences. You're really di looking at different social sur surroundings. And, of course, sometimes these could lead to physical impairment. A lot of work, uh, for example, recently done uh, even in my university in Harvard, indicates that if you have a very deprived childhood, it can actually lead to real serious handicap throughout your life in terms of your ability to grow as a person, uh, your ability even to perform certain intellectual exercises may be impaired. Not because you're genetically any inferior, just at an early phase of your life, particularly preschool phase, you might have been neglected. So that problem remains, of course, and so in so far as there are disadvantages arising from that, you want to compensate. Now, one of the things that the Indian Constitution did, uh, of course, was to have some reservation for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. And the argument there was that um, um, there are two types of argument, really. One argument was that if you hold an exam, um, competitive exam, people who have had a disadvantaged schooling for the same merit, for the same ability to to administer estates or distribute justice or whatever it is IAS officers do, uh, it may be that, you are, uh, that your skill would not be reflected in good economic perf exam performance so much. So there is that. So in order to correct the epistemic failure, the knowledge failure in the exam, uh, you ought to do that. And the other is uh, it would be very good for, uh, for some lower caste and, and scheduled tribe people to be involved in administering states because, after all, uh, the, uh, even with the best of theories, we recognize that the administration 
the nature of the administrator makes some difference to the way administration is done. <coughs> is this an argument that you buy, that you agree with? I, I think in principle both these arguments I buy. Yes, I think they're both right. Uh, the question is how, uh, how much you push this argument and also what cost you pay. Well, how far would you push it and what cost well, would I you pay? Well, I think that is an empirical uh, matter, really. And, you know, I think this is a matter where it would be a great mistake to try to just generalize, saying that, you know, 55% is the right number, or 25 is, or 37 is. I think it's very important to know the reasons why we are pushing for it. I think the part of my problem with the debate that took place here is that people got sort of uh, stratified into took position on different sides and forcefully pursued that. My own friends got split into different camps. And uh, sometimes, of course, people even sense that you are saying something in favor of reservation uh, when, in fact, it may be a very passing reference. In one of my reviews of my, of my book, um, uh, I, it was attributed on the basis of the one sentence that I must be saying reservation. All of it is a very good thing. Uh, I think the. Uh, one has to recognize that there is a very good reason for reservation, both in terms of doing fairness to merits, uh, which fails to be reflected in exam, and the need for heterogeneity of the administrative class. But having said that, there is also the question that you don't want to push it in such a way that the quality of administration is impaired. Uh, much of your work uh, has uh, dealt with the problems of hunger and poverty, and you have written about this uh, both uh, as it applies in, in the developed world uh, and in the developing world. Uh, you have related this to the idea of uh, inequality, and in, 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 in you mentioned this earlier, uh, and registering your, your wider concern, uh, inequality, equality of what? Uh, when I sort of travel in my uh, air-conditioned car and I look out of the window, I see gross inequality, but I also see enormous amounts of deprivation and want and suffering that, that I don't want to confront. What do you see? It hits us in the eye, of course, in a way that uh, you know that we are all used to being, um, you know, being raised in this country and being brought up in this country. Of course, I witnessed. Um, I think you were you would not have been born then. I mean, I witnessed the Bengal famine because I was nine years old at that time. A very powerful memory of of, of people dying in the streets and so on. So I think um, that's one of the things that um, remain with one throughout. And in my case, actually, it's affected the nature of my uh, direction of my work throughout also some of the early experiences. Oddly enough, I think some of the pictures of deprivation of my childhood days are stronger in my memory than what one sees now. It's partly because it seemed so unnatural then, and then of course one gets cynical and gets used to the fact that the world is a uh, pitiless, nasty place uh, where that kind of thing is happening all the time. One, you know, it's like any pain after a little while, you get used to it, and it doesn't feel so painful anymore, perhaps, which must be the case. I mean, my earliest memories are memory of the famine of Bengal, 43, the riots of, um, in Dhaka, where I was then, um, you know, Hindus and Muslims killing each other in a kind of senseless, extraordinary manner. Uh, and, of course, um, atrocities of a similar kind, not exactly the same kind, but similar kind, have continue to occur now, and um, I guess one's reaction is, is, is the same in some ways, but it doesn't any longer have the kind of hitting uh, impact, which I remember as a child having that. It's partly because one has got, uh, one's got so used to deprivation, I think. Is that, uh, do you think, stem from an acceptance of, of, of inequality as, as being sort of the yin and the yang of our existence? I think Perhaps, unfortunately, perhaps so. I mean, uh, young and young, I wouldn't know. But I, I think um, it certainly, as a child, I, must, uh, I, I certainly did think that it should be possible to eliminate all these very rapidly, very quick. Uh, indeed, of course, um, many of us uh, had interest in politics precisely for that reason, in order to, 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 to set the world right. Now, I think we're all somewhat more skeptical about the possibility of rapid radical change. Uh, that doesn't mean that the possibilities are necessarily utopian. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, certainly there is more, more skepticism now, and I think um, to that extent, uh, I think the acceptability of these things, or acceptance rather than acceptability, acceptance of these things perhaps does arise from, from a sense that you couldn't radically change it. But I think it's possible to go too far, to become too cynical of change, and I think um, 
the big changes in society have taken place precisely because people have refused to accept that, and I think that applies uh, in India as well as the rest of the world. You were born in Shantani Ketan, and uh, you did a PhD from Cambridge, you went back to Jadapur University to teach, uh, you spent much of your life at, at, at the repositories, the best repositories of learning in, 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 in the Western world. Uh, what do you think have been some of the major influences in your, in your life in, in evolving your uh, political economic philosophy? Uh. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, of course, um, my interest in, in getting into economics was concerned with uh, uh, these problems. Um, I began starting doing physics. Actually, in school, I was very interested in Sanskrit. My two subjects of interest were Sanskrit and mathematics. Ultimately, mathematics won because in those days it was hard to continue to do both because the, the school has a cunning technique whereby these lectures clashed so that at some stage uh, you had to abandon. I had done by then nine, I think ten years of Sanskrit so it was, I was reluctantly had to move and specialize in, econo in mathematics and I started doing physics. But in moving from there to economics uh, I think politics played a part because economics seemed very important for dealing with these uh, deprivations we are talking about. Uh, I was very lucky to have some uh, remarkable co-students, Shukumar Chakravarti being one of them, who, who actually had a role in my moving from, uh, from physics to economics. And uh, then we, of course, in Presidency College, where I did my first degree, uh, we had some extremely good teachers, um, Baba Tuzatta, Tapash Mujumda, a number of people, very inspiring teachers. Um, later on, uh, when I moved to, to Cambridge, uh, I was very lucky in having, again, a number of um, extraordinarily fine teachers. Uh, Morris Dobb was probably the strongest influence. He was a Marxist economist. Piero Schraffer was another one. Uh, Dennis Robertson was a very important figure. Joan Robinson was another one. So I was very lucky, actually. I was pampered in some ways, uh, having had very good teachers. And, um, of course, uh, Omiya Dasgupta, whom I also knew well, and, uh, and uh, for a while I even worked with him. So I was very lucky in getting extremely good teachers of very different political views between Dennis Robertson's um, uh, liberal conservatism and Maurice Dobbs' Marxism. There was an enormous gulf. But they were all extremely fine human beings, full of sympathy. And I think what was very striking for me is how much of their e economics of very different kind um, were motivated by, by deep human sympathy. And I think in some ways um, this idea that human sympathy is a very integral part of economics education uh, certainly come, came, came through very sharply uh, in terms of my luck in having very good teachers. Mm. Uh, you, you have said that uh, a historical perspective is crucial in, involving, in evolving and planning economic strategies. Uh, when you look at India today, do you feel that we have arrived at our economic restructuring through a process of, 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 of evolution, uh, through an understanding of the historical processes that we have been through, uh, or, or has this been imposed by the imperatives of the new world economic order and what is happening outside? To some extent it's been based on studying uh, history, of course, that, uh, that in fact countries which have integrated more with the world economy have tended to do uh, very well. The other side of it is that I think the historical lesson to learn from the experience of these countries is rather different, I think, from just relying so much on liberalization and, 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 and economic reform and just opening up. Um, because all these countries have a much higher base of elementary education. Um, and a much higher base of public health care than India. Not, that South, not only that South Korea today or China today or Hong Kong today is enormously ahead of India today in education health, but South Korea, when it began its economic reforms of the 1960s, or China, when it began the economic reform in 79, uh, and similarly for all these countries, already then they were enormously ahead in education and health care than we are now. And I think that's, uh, and there I think some historical lessons would be very important for people to bear in mind. And I think um, one would tend to think that India's success would be in exactly the areas in which it has been very successful recently, namely kind of high-tech modern techniques in industries around Bangalore could easily prosper. We have a high education sector for every person that China sends to higher education, we compare it to with our population send six such people. So, and even if some of the quality of education is bad, there's still quite a lot of highly skilled people around. 
So we can take the world on in terms of computer programming and so forth. On the other hand, the reason why the, the, for example, to take the Chinese, the, one of the reasons why the Chinese have been able to raise their income level so much since the reforms of 79, is because they're not going in only for this high tech thing, typically not at all. In fact, there are my desk in, 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 in Harvard, if it has one floppy disk of high sophistication from Bangalore, it had uh, paper clips and pins and, and staplers, all made in China. Now these, of course, are immensely employment in intensive, providing employment to a whole lot of uh, very poor people. And there, I think, elementary education is extremely important because it quite often these require kind of simple instruction that you have to read to follow certain lines. Not terribly sophisticated thing. One of the oddities is that you know China had changed its economic policy radically, of course, after the economic reforms. But while it changed its policy and moved away from this closed position to an open position, it could rely on the achievement of the previous regime, the pre-reform regime, in raising education, elementary education, raising public health care, so that it, in a sense, while it rejected the economic policies of the past, it was standing on the shoulders of the education and health achievements of the previous period. And to some extent, of course, in, in India, if, it, if economic reform, say, in a state like Kerala went in that direction, it can emulate China. But not many of the Indian states could, even if the reforms were complete, because of the fact that the education itself would be a big barrier there. I think there's considerable concern. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there is the, the euphoria that market rationality uh, will, will, will deliver and, 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 and solve the many problems that, that liberalization and reform will throw up. Um, if, you know, we, we see in the countries of, of, um, of Europe that the socialists are coming back to power in some senses or are coming back in strength. Uh, and this is more in terms of a shifting of, of priorities on the national agenda rather than the restructuring of economic activity. Uh, the question is really, in India, um, is, is, do we seek a middle ground? Uh, there is concern, there is despair about the ability of government uh, to deliver on primary education, to deliver on health, to deliver on virtually anything. So at the moment we seem to be pulling out the stops and yes. saying market rationality is going to deliver it all. Yeah, well I think that's right. I think, um, uh, I think we're going through a kind of phase of um, um, uh, tremendous promise of market rationality. Uh, I, I think that market has a lot to offer, in fact. On the other hand, it's a great mistake to imagine that it can uh, offer single-handed a lot of things which, uh, which it could not conceivably do. Uh, whether or not the state is inefficient in delivering public education at the elementary level, this is not going to happen in any other way. It will have to be the state. So that one has to find ways and means of delivering elementary education through public channels uh, widely enough, uh, because the private sector simply can't manage that level of thing, because there isn't enough money to be made in that. Now, in that context, um, I think domestic politics is very important. And uh, I'm always shocked by the extent to which uh, the political process in India seems to pay no attention to matters of illiteracy or matters of school attendance. Why aren't these political matters, why aren't these explosive issues for the governments in power? Why is it that the fact that two-thirds of the UP school uh, school uh, school age girls don't go to school why isn't it a, a matter for the opposition to 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 thunder the the government's wit uh, and why is it the absence of teachers from a school isn't a more of a dynamic political issue now i think if one sees the process of economic change being closely related to political activism i think the the direction is has to be also that it's not just a question of asking the government to behave better it's also uh, the question of asking the opposition parties to, to, to take on these issues, the newspapers to be more active. It is, after all, a participatory process. And what you're referring to, Europe, and I, I very much agree with you, that this kind of tremendous euphoria that market could do it all, that's a bubble that basically busts. I mean, you know, there was uh, Soviet Union. Well, why it's inefficient? Well, because it has no markets and only government. Now, then you marketize, and then instead of having an economic growth, goes down, uh, industrial output 5% one year, 10% next year, 15% third year. And then you feel, my God, you're hit by even bigger plague than you had. And uh, the recognition then is that there is a kind of understanding what role that the government can play and, and how it might play it best. And I think uh, since we at least have, uh, you raised earlier the question of learning from history, 
Um, we should learn not only from our own history, we should learn also from the history of other countries, uh, China and Russia and, and West Europe and the United States and East Asia. There are a lot of lessons for the world. And I think I would have thought that the things that come through are the recognition that markets are important, but markets are not exclusively important. The government have a role with in health, education, as well as in initiating some industrial change, as it has played even in South Korea and Japan and, and, and so on, not to mention China. Then there is a understanding that political processes are terribly important. And there I think West Europe has a lot to offer, even though their conditions are very different. But the question of um, using the political process, multi-party democratic process, for the purpose of making the government move in the right direction, for the purpose of generating efficiency, even in public sector, like say school, uh, school attendance and the school teachers work, and making the government ashamed of the extent of illiteracy. These are, are matters in which the multi-party structure of India can be very important. And the, the lesson there make welcome from West Europe, precisely because we happen to have a political system, as far as multi-party system goes, more like West Europe. Namely, there are a number of political parties which compete in elections. Our situation isn't like that in, uh, in the typical African or Asian country. So that there are lessons from all these areas. You have written extensively on, 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 on the issue of unemployment. Um, and, and, and we tend to equate the problem of unemployment with merely creating jobs. And we need to create a lot of jobs because we have a problem with population. Uh, I think um, one has to see the unemployment problem in terms of um, what it is, that is, it is a large number of people um, who are very difficult to absorb uh, given the nature of the industry and agricultural production structure that we happen to have now. It, we re have to recognize why unemployment is such a problem. There are basically two reasons. One, that if you're unemployed, you haven't got a source of income, so it's poverty. And the other is that uh, people like being employed. It's, it's good for self-respect. It's good for uh, um, having a cogent, healthy social life and so forth. So from all these points of view, you have to expand. And so it's a question of making the job opportunities expand. Earlier on, we were talking about the role of elementary education, and I think it's very important. There have been, and oddly enough in India, there has been more skepticism on the economic role of elementary education in this country than any other that I know of. Uh, and uh, you know, people would say Indian peasants are terribly wise, which probably they are. And they will tell you that uh, mere education does not make you employable. All these are true. On the other hand, the fact of the matter is, and it's brought out by the historical experience of all the countries which have grown fast, that, uh, and grown in employment fast, is that the employability of people, um, masses of people, turn to a great extent on their ability to, to, to follow little instructions in their production work, to be able to maintain quality. One of the big problems in Indian export is quality control. Now, there's no way of having quality control without having a literate culture, which is concerned with what is it exactly you are asked to do and whether you've done it. And so in all these ways, while education on its own does not generate jobs, it is a very important part of employment creation. So if I'm, um, somebody described me as being um, uh, a bit manic on the subject of expanding elementary education, and which I am, but I think the manicity, if that's a possible word, is connected really with uh, seeing the role of education not just in the well-being and freedom that individuals enjoy, but also in the, in the economic side. Uh, the, the, the most sort of serious charge that I've heard against you, or, or criticism of your writing, is that you're utopian. What is your utopia? Well, I think you're probably referring to my friend Andre Betei and his um, review of my last book, Inequality Exam in Colomarsis and Utopia. Well, of course, uh, there are two issues there. One is, um, um, ut what is a utopia? It depends on what you regard as realistic. And our views of what is realistic varies. Uh, there is, of course, also the question that, uh, that uh, we think about objectives which would be good to achieve, even when we don't think that it is fully achievable. I mean, we don't say, there's no point in talking about equality because we can never have equality. No point in talking about liberty or nonviolence because we can never have complete nonviolence. We know that. But nevertheless, nonviolence is an important virtue. Liberty is an important virtue. Equality is an important virtue. But when you say that, it's not because you are naive and you believe that you can live in a utopian society with full equality, full liberty, and full nonviolence. 
It's just that that is a, that important thing to know in order to get some idea as to which direction you'd like to move. So if you're thinking of my, uh, as it were, utopia, uh, in the sense not of something which I think I can achieve immediately or we can achieve immediately, but it's a question of what gives us vision, I think it's a, it's, it's a subject uh, of, um, of thinking about um, 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 high quality of life on, on the part of uh, most people without great inequalities in it, uh, and judging them not in terms of just per capita income, uh, nor even just mental satisfaction as utilitarians do, but the richness of life and how much freedom we have, whether we can, um, um, uh, whether we, ha I if we can pursue the different types of objectives uh, that we might uh, have reason to defend, whether we have to time to reflect on what our objectives are. I mean, so I think in some ways the kind of society one would look for is a society of freedom, a substantive freedom in, in pursuing these different objectives. And, but, you know, if, before you jump to saying it, <laughs> it's utopian, I'm not saying that we're going to get there immediately. But unless we start thinking about that, I don't think we would even move in that direction. Thank you very much, Professor Sen. We do hope that uh, your utopia is going to inspire us to move in that direction. Thank you very much indeed.